I, I actually think that for people like me who are trying to deal with their weight, God gave us this day to start your diet. I mean, I mean, would I have not eaten today if he said, don't do that? I'm still not sure what deny yourself really totally encompasses because, uh, you know, God has given us a lot of good things. And uh, so denial has to have a, have a purpose. And actually, the, the word in Hebrew is to humble yourself, which means to be brought down to the earth. Okay? It, it, it's kind of like returning to the place you came from. You don't depend on anything. But what really, I think, helps me deal with this day the most is the idea that it was not that the people denied themselves. You know, we have this sense of sacrifice being something that you lose. But what the people really wanted to see, the reason they hung around for this whole day until the end of it all, was they wanted to see that high priest come out through that curtain because then they knew that God was doing what he said he would do. Like John said in the last one, you will be cleansed. At that day when that was over with, you had been cleansed. Now, this is not going to be a presentation. I want this to be a discussion as much as anything because identity is a subject that we struggle with. Um, partly for ourselves, but partly because we recognize that there is a day coming when there are going to be a whole lot of people show up as Levites that we don't know. And somehow we're going to have to be strong enough in our identity to be able to, I won't say bring them in, I will say become one with them. And that's a significant change because we've been here a long time. And nobody really cares who we are. We must be right where God wants us because there isn't a single person who seems to, to want us for anything. But uh, we have all these promises in Scripture. I mean, we know a lot about being Levites. But there's going to come a day when somebody will show up and all they'll want to be is another Levite. And they won't care what our history is in this place. Uh, they'll probably want to learn about Maurice Glendening and and the restoration and a lot of things that, that we can help them understand concepts. But they're not going to see us as the top, top dogs of anything. You know, we don't own this place and we're going to let them live here. It's, it's not that sort of concept. And so that's really the focus. When we get done with all of this, um, I want us to have that sense that our job in the future is going to be to help people uh, acquire the inheritance once they have acquired their identity. Now in Israel it's pretty clear that each tribe has an inheritance. They were given a portion of the land except for Levi and they were given the, the priesthood, the service of the sanctuary, the service to all the people. They were spread throughout the people. So, um, and, and I'm not going to display a bunch of words what I'd like you to do is let your mind reinforce the value of your identity as you think about some of these comments. And I don't want you to learn about identity. I want you to build identity. And not just for yourself, that's essential, but also so that you can help other people. You know, we've really been blessed in Levi and Aaron because we've been given our identity. Most of the people who are, who are coming into the Hebraic roots are doing that because they have a sense of being Ephraim. But that's about as much as most of them know. They want to be Israel. They want to have the promises that were given to Israel. But they don't know the specifics of who they are in Israel. And in conjunction with what God is doing with, with other parts of, uh, of his people, we're going to share in, in helping people acquire their own inheritance and understand their identity. I wanted to start today though with with a greeting. Yoma Shalom. Do you know what that means? What's Yom? Hebrew for day. Yoma is the word for the day. That's how uh, 
Judaism, the traditional references to the Day of Atonement are the day. So this is Yomah. And in scripture, when you see the day, when you see the day approaching, well, there's a general concept of that, but the specific of that is this day. It's the Day of Atonement. So, Yom Shalom. All right, close enough. We won't push that real hard. Okay, now specifically to this, to this idea of identity, and I know I've told you this joke before, but to me, this really kind of typifies where we'll find a lot of people. Uh, this guy is on an airplane, and for whatever reason, he wasn't able to get the seat that he thought he was entitled to. There were no first-class upgrades or whatever. And he's just getting more and more upset about this, so he walks back to where the, to where the flight attendants are working, and he says, do you know who I am? And one flight attendant looks at the other and says, oh, great, another guy who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> now, that's an identity crisis. And, and I submit maybe that that's what we're looking at in this day of restoration of the scattered people. We have an identity crisis to deal with. Only it's more likely to be an honest question. You're going to have somebody who feels this call to Israel come up to you in some way or another and say, do you know who I am? And it's not because they're arrogant. They want some, the head place at the table, for example. It's that they recognize that God has given inheritance to his people, and they want to know which part is theirs. They want to be part of that people that's been promised their inheritance, and that inheritance is based on identity. So I got thinking about, well, what, what does identity really mean? And I always like to go back to the dictionary first. And... Uh, and the word identity comes from a Latin word. It's called idem. You'll see it in legal documents. It's used, abbreviated as ID, period. It means the same. And identity over the years came from this combination of idem et idem in Latin, which got contracted to ident. It just means the same and the same. And you can get this idea that identity has to do with existence. It has to do with just being. And so this is, this is my first uh, uh, question for, I'll say, individuals. And, and I'm going to ask Kara first. And I don't care if you're playing with the iPad. I was playing with mine earlier. But if someone comes, let's say I come up to you and I don't know you, and I say, Kara, who are you? How do you answer that? Okay, you're Kara Conrad. She starts with her name. Okay. What else do you say? They say, well, that's a nice name. How else can I understand who you are? You live in Eskdale. Okay. What else would you tell them? Okay. Right. Okay, you're in sixth grade, talk about school. David said who your parents are. Well, now you're getting in dangerous territory because you've started to associate yourself and you don't know how this person feels about those other people. <laughs> well, I don't know how I feel about those Conrad people. And, and, and then they might say, oh, and that Ben Conrad, he's John and Joy's son. And, and they belong to Brother... I'm, I don't know if I like this, but you have identified yourself how? Relationships to other things, places, people, sometimes events. If you say you're a 9-11 survivor, people are going to know something particular about you. Okay? Now, what does that mean in terms of your identity? See, psychologists have struggled with this almost forever since there was a psychologist. And I don't know when that started, but um, the Greeks had philosophers. I don't know when psychologists started. 
But this idea of existence, how do we understand existence? Who am I? See, it's one thing for me to ask Kara that question. But who are you? But when I ask the question of myself, who am I? That gets to be a little tougher. Now, I can do the same thing Kara did. I know who my parents were and my siblings and my children. And I'm married to Margo. And I, and I know those things about my experience. But who am I? Just me. How would you answer that question? See, without something else to relate to, can you really answer that question? Because the only one who can answer that question is the Creator. And we are not our own Creator. And I found this interesting because I got thinking about that's the question that Moses asked. Remember when he went to the burning bush and he said, Oh, I've got to see this. And he gets closer and God says, Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. I want to talk to you. And after they have this conversation for a little while, and Moses starts to figure out what his future is looking like, he says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Can you see the importance of the name? What is his name? Now, culturally, every God in 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 that time had a name. You remember Dagon was the god of the Philistines, you had Baal, you had Molech, you had all of these gods that, uh, that people worshipped. And so they want to know, well what's his name? Because culturally if his name is the same as one of the Egyptian gods, that's a different deal. If it's different from the Egyptian gods, then they know that they, their identity lies related to some other group of people. Okay? So here's his answer. He sa God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now, doesn't that sound a bit arrogant? You know, do you remember Popeye's response? I am what I am and that's all that I am. Okay? Now, well, there's some newer Popeye stuff, but anyway. But really, it's egotistical for us, isn't it, to say, well, I'm me, and that's all you need to know. I am who I am. And you can either like it or lump it. Well, that isn't God's response. What he's saying is, I am the self-existent one. I simply exist. I have always existed. I exist today. I will always exist in the future. And these two words that's used, because we struggle somewhat with, like, what is the name of God? Do we use Yahweh? Do we use Yahweh? Do we use Yah? Do we use Yahovah? They come out of these words that are used. The first one is Hayah. It says to exist, to become, or to come to pass. And, and it says in parentheses, always emphatic. That means it will happen, or it is true. And then we have Hava, which says to breathe or to be, to have life, really. And so we have this, this idea of, of just being. You know, one of the philosophers says, I think, therefore I am. And I have no idea which one that was. Sharon probably knows. Okay, so we have this idea of the name. And what I wanted to do, uh, I picked some scriptures here because this is interesting in terms of how, how God has given us this idea that the name is, is valuable. This is from Isaiah 43. It says, But now this is what the Lord, Yahweh, says. He who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. This is the creator. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Okay. Now that's a reference to Jacob and Israel. So we understand that there is a, 
there is a group of people that he has assembled. And he's, in essence, given an identity to, hasn't he? And he made promises to Israel. But there are individuals within that group, and we, and we want to be careful that we remember that. Groups figure uh, heavily in identity issues. But groups are always made of individuals. Okay. Second one is in Genesis. And this is kind of where you can see maybe your own attitudes or how, how man is uh, on his own. This is Genesis 11. This is the story about, about Babel and the people after the flood. He says, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They had this desire to be a strong people, that their identity would be meaningful, in some cases even feared. Okay, in 2 Samuel, he's talking with David. He says, how great, or David is talking to him. He says, how great are you, O sovereign Lord, Yahweh. There is no one like you. There is no God but you, and we have heard, as we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself to perform great and awesome wonders? See, God is adding to his identity, his name, by doing something. And so you can see that your identity has to do with your actions in a lot of cases. You know, if you're mighty and powerful, people recognize your name because they know what you did. Now, how does the name Hitler strike everybody? Okay. Your name can be good or bad. But your identity is established by what you do. Okay, in Isaiah 56, he says, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. Now, in the case of asking Kara who she is, if she's Ben and Chandra's daughter, what name could be better than sons and daughters? I mean, think about that. If you have a sense of the future, how could that name be better than your descendants? And yet that's one of the promises. It says, I will give them an everlasting name that will, be not, that will not be cut off. Now recognize, for a eunuch, they're not able to have children. Okay, and so what God is promising is that for those who are with him, he will give them this name that continues on, even though they don't have children. And in uh, Revelation 19, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. Now, what would it be like for you to have a name that only you knew? What would that mean? Is that an identity that means anything to other people? Not really. Because if no one else knows your name, you know, it's kind of like the old Cheers theme song, you know, where no one knows your name. You're nobody. You can go in there and hide because nobody knows who you are. But in this case, this is a spiritual truth that there is a name that only he knows. I don't understand how that works, but it apparently is essential because he goes on, this is actually earlier in Revelation 2, says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it. So only God and only the person knows that name. To me, that's a mystery. 
But there is something going on in the spirit that obviously we don't understand. And so God says, I'm going to do this because it's going to be a good thing. If you overcome, this will be your situation. And obviously, the last verse in Revelation isn't the end of the history of man. So there's more to come. Okay, so identity and value are defined by the Creator. Uh, in Psalm 139, David says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, David understood who he was. You know, that's a struggle for a lot of people, and particularly people before they come to understand what Jesus did, why he's of value. If you don't see yourself as a creation of the living God, it's very difficult to understand. A lot of the despair that we see in our society is because people don't know who they are. They don't know who they belong to. They can't say like Kara can, oh, these are my parents, these are my people, this is where I live. I have value because of all of these things. And there are two characteristics, I don't want to get too deep into them, but value is both intrinsic and extrinsic or external. Intrinsic means that you're valuable simply because you are. It's kind of like diamonds. Diamonds are rare enough, and we know from our experience that a diamond is valuable just because it's a diamond. Now, as Kashana will tell you, it's more valuable because it went in a ring, and it becomes even more valuable when that ring went on her hand. So, so that's, that's intrinsic. Intrinsic value, that's the part of our identity that says, my name, because I was created in his image, all of that has intrinsic value. I don't have to be anywhere. I don't have to do anything. I am valuable because I am, and because my father is the great I am. Okay? Now, external things of identity, of value that are in our identity, have to do with where we are, what we do, who we're related to, and there are a lot of other things like that. My point of that is that we are not able to judge the value of another person. We don't know what value the Creator has placed on them and where He is in the process of using them for His purposes. That's why it says, don't judge, or you will be judged. And if you judge, you'll be judged in the same way you judge. And the implication of that is, stop it. Okay? It's like repentance, judgment. Stop it. Because God is the only one who knows enough to judge. Okay? Our identity is indeed in Him. Now, as Levites... Did we decide that we were going to be Levites? How did you find out, or how do you know, that you are a Levite? Anybody? Wake up. Okay, through a patriarchal blessing. Doug was old enough to have been a person, a reasonable person, almost a complete adult legally in the, almost in the eyes of, of the law. Didn't know he was a Levite. So someone came along and told him he was a Levite, someone who had the right to do that. Okay. How, how many others are in that same situation? Okay. That probably reflects the aging of our of our organization. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Which brings up another good point. How else can you become a Levite? What? Okay, birth, adoption, you can marry one. Okay. See, this identity has a lot to do with where we find ourselves. The, the things God has us go through, the information he reveals to us, all of those kinds of things will, will affect what our identity is. Now, Betsy? Okay. And we've met those people at almost every conference we've been to. I feel like I'm a Levite. Doug? Okay. Cowan, Cohen. Yeah. Okay. So we have this genealogical connection, if you want to look at it that way. Family history. Now, I think one of our best examples of people who don't have that kind of connection is probably Maurice Glendening. But think about what happened with Maurice Glendening. When God got his attention, what did he do? And you guys should all know the history, so I'm going to let you answer the questions. How did he find out who he was? Okay, there was some genealogy, and how did that come about? Okay, supernatural assistance. Okay, what are some of the tangible things? Betsy? Okay. Okay. Well, and, and I think that's important, and hopefully we'll, we'll get some more discussion on that. But, you know, there was nothing on his birth certificate that said a son of Aaron or of the tribe of Levi. I mean, you had this family tradition, uh, and family traditions are pretty good. Sometimes they'll help hold a family together. They'll give you direction, a lot of those kinds of things. But how do you know they're really true? You know, if you want to go knock on God's door and say, I'm a Levite, I want the blessings of the Levites, what confidence do you have that that's really true? And, and that's where the role of the patriarch, I think that's what Doug was talking about. Um, God has patriarchs. And, you know, even the writings say a man is forever the patriarch of his own, of his own children. But God has patriarchs. Uh, whose job it will be in this restoration to say, okay, this is where you belong. Think about Eliezer and, and Joshua when they, were, when they were parceling out the land after they crossed the Jordan. You know, they cast lots and said, this is where you're going. Well, you always have to know that when you cast lots, God is in charge of how they fall. And so they were assigned their inheritance based on the tribe they belonged to in that particular fashion. And it goes on to say later on in, in Torah that if you're born into that tribe, then that inheritance is your inheritance. And it can't be sold, it can't be given away, it's a perpetual inheritance. And the reason for that is, again, it all belongs to God who is your creator and from whom you get your identity. Now, I like what Paul has to say, because he says, uh, he gives this pottery example, and I'd, I'd like to read a little bit of it. 
but I probably can't find it. Ah, here it is. I killed several trees last night with my printer. This is from Romans 9. He says, But one of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us for he who, res who resists his will? But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall, we, shall what is formed say to one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? And uh, that's an important concept because in our identity, we want to recognize the value that our Creator has given us, but we also have to admit His right to use us for whatever His purpose is. And sometimes that's a little harder to take. You know, sometimes we feel like we're being uh, put upon or abused or whatever. And it is one of the characteristics, I think, of our society today that we want to say, well, that's not what I wanted to do. And so I'm being denied my rights. Understand that you don't have rights. You have promises and you have responsibilities as far as God is concerned. Rights would make you God. So, in that sense, you don't have any rights. On the other hand, well, I'd say you do. You have the choice to follow him or not. We'll, we'll give you that one. Um, and beyond that, then, if you choose not to, everything is yours. The responsibility, the consequences, all the rest of it. And you are not available for the promises that go with your identity as one of God's people. See, this whole thing of identity has to do with um, if you stand up, who would somebody identify you as in terms of these two groups of people? Are you one of God's people or are you not? Because that's really what this Day of Atonement is about is identifying who is God's and who isn't. And the Levitical writings talk about this by saying, it's the oil of our salvation burning in our lamps by which we will be recognized when he comes. So there's this process of accepting Yeshua, of being changed, of having the Holy Spirit that gives us an additional element to our identity. It tells the Father who we've chosen to belong to. That we accept His way through Yeshua. And we're not going to turn to our own way. See, one of the concepts of the Day of Atonement is that those whose names are written in the Book of Life, as the judges in heaven go through all of the sins that have been committed, those sins that are covered by Yeshua, by Him as the sacrifice, they go to the book of life. And at the final judgment, those whose names who are not written in the book of life, that's the end of the road. And that's why we need to understand the Day of Atonement. It's not the end of the road every year. That's the nice thing about the feast cycle, is you get to do it again the next year. And to my knowledge from the history, they say they always tied a rope to the to the leg of the high priest. That seems to have been urban legend because there's no recorded instance where he never accomplished his task. So, okay, so we understand that Maurice Glendening was given a lot of help in understanding his identity. Um, writings, let's see, what is it? 138, 139, 140, I think 143. They all talk about things related to who his ancestors were. And then we have, we have the animal skin, and we have the marble tablet. We have the, the traditions passed down by his father. But God, in his kindness, gave Maurice Glendening assurance of who he was. You know, It's a little like Moses when he was at the burning bush. God knew Moses was going to need some help to get this to accept that this was his job. Because Moses was going to become the biggest thorn in Pharaoh's side that had ever existed. 
and he needed to have the strength of his identity for him to continue in that role. And that's going to be the same for us today. We need to have the strength of our identity and the surety of the promises that go with it to be able to go down the road God has called us to go down. Now, let's take another example. I'll use, I'll use Brianna. She's awake. I'll use you. I don't want to use somebody I have to wake up. <laughs> How's that go? A Waco sleeper? Something like that. So, Brianna, what happens if you suddenly doubt that you really are Ben and Chandra's daughter? How would that make you feel? Would home be the same after that? Probably not. See, if you're not sure of the people that you're related to, then you have no, no assurance that they are going to treat you well. You know, they could take your car, they could, who knows? So we need to know that our identity that's linked to other people is secure. Within ourselves as a group, if we don't trust and support each other, then our identity, both as individuals and as a house, is weakened. You have to be able to say, kind of like the story that Betsy said, we Aaron's, we Levites, however you, the answer has to come, you have to be able to say, as a Levite, as an Aaronite, because of who I am, these are things I have to do or things I will not do. You have to be able to make that choice. Now, we're much more familiar with our choices than we are with some of the other tribes. We know that Judah is, is the, has the kingship, he's the ruler. But we don't know exactly what that's going to mean for them to say, I'm of Judah, and this requires me or prevents me from doing certain things. Or those of Ephraim, either as the gathered group of the ten tribes or as an individual tribe, Joseph was charged or given the right of, of the birthright. It's his job to provide for the whole family. We don't know what that might mean for those of Ephraim who say, I have to do this for my people. But that's what the identity will require them to do. That identity combined with the, the gift of the birthright makes them responsible for the welfare of the entire house, the house of Jacob. So as Levi and Aaron, we not only have to know what our requirements and benefits are, we also are going to have to be able to respect those of the other tribes, as God calls them. And so in the same context of not being able to judge as individuals, we also can't judge another in what their identity requires of them. That's God's business. What do we know about Levi and the other tribes? What's the foundational truth about that? Yeah, that, that relationship. God's people. God's chosen people. That's the one thing that holds us together. Everything else is details. And there are a lot of details. But you always have to remember that as Levi or as Judah or as Naphtali or Gad or whoever, that that identity is within the whole house of Israel. And that God will deal with us as a house. Now, right now we have a split house. 
We have Judah, who's been very protective. They've been on the front lines. They've never lost their identity. And they've paid a price for it for thousands of years. And we have Ephraim, who went off and did their own thing, got scattered, don't know who they are or where they are. And that's what's got to be changed. There has to be a house of Ephraim, a whole house, to be joined with the house of Judah before there is a whole house of Israel. That's the context of what we're working in. And as it says in the writings, as you can see from Scripture, Levi and Aaron are essential to the operation of the whole house. And we will be essential in the gathering of people who don't know who they are. So we have a big job ahead of us. And it's going to take courage and conviction that we are and we will be who God said we will be. And when we get into the book of Malachi, that really is the whole point. We are not without fault. There are several scriptures where God says, I will not let you go unpunished. And the book of Malachi is a great example of what's true about that of one tribe because of what we didn't respect. Okay, so back to inheritance. What's the word for name in Hebrew? Shem. Okay. Hashem means the name. That's, that's why the Jews, not wanting to pronounce his name incorrectly or inappropriately, use Hashem. Now, why they won't even use the English word God with an O in the middle, I've still never figured out, but... Okay, so, is a name enough to establish your identity? If I say Ben Conrad, is that enough? Okay, if you know him. Around here, is that enough? Yeah, sometimes it's too much. Okay. In Las Vegas, is that enough? No. Ben would prefer the name Ben Conrad never be heard in Las Vegas. But... So you have to recognize that identities have contexts. See, in the dairy world, at least in Utah, if you say John Conrad, do you think people would know who you meant? In general, yeah. In BYU, would they know who John Conrad? Well, they might. That's probably a bad example. But what you'll recognize is that in broader context, the name isn't enough. And I wanted to read you how Paul described himself. If I can find it. That's the problem with all this paper. While I'm looking for it, tell me the difference between a title and a name. What's a title? Okay, job description. In the context of the word Lord, what does that mean? That's a title, right? And, and what does it really mean? The boss? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's use the word president. Okay, that's a title, right? So, there have been at least, I think it's 45 people with different names that have had that title. So we need to recognize that titles are not part of our identity. They may associate us with certain things, and I'll say in a loose kind of identity, but more in the sense of grouping us. They don't really define who we are. You know, there was nothing, I'll say, in George Bush that defined him as being the president. He was elected by the people. Same with Barack Obama. Same with whoever wins in, in 2016. 
Okay, so we want to be careful. That's why it's so important and we've emphasized that we use the name of God as much as we can because he has a name. And it's by his name that he was to be known to his people. He said, tell them, I am has sent me to you. And that's the root of our, of our word, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahovah, all of those things. All right, now I can't find this. See, John, I should have put this together as a presentation. What did I do with it? Does anybody know where I put my notes? No. Fortunately, I clipped all these things together this morning. Or I wouldn't know where anything is. That's not it. I know it was there last night. Okay, we're getting there. Mostly because we're getting to the bottom of the pile. All right. I'm just going to try and paraphrase it. Then. Paul said, and I think it's in Philippians. There it is, printed right on the page where I left it. Before I, well, I'll go ahead and do this. Paul says in two places. In Romans 11, he says, I asked then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself. Look at how he identifies himself. I am an Israelite myself. That was his first uh, association. A descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, I find it interesting that he would do it in that order. Because if you were doing genealogy, it would be Abraham first, and then Israel, and then Benjamin, and then down the line would be Paul. That's why I put this chart up here, and I know it's impossible for you to read in the back, but I'd like to, when I get done, give you a little break to come up and look at this. Because this is a genealogy from Adam to Jesus. And along here is the time scale for that period of history. And in there are the 12 tribes and the prophets and, uh, and the important people that we find in Scripture. And somewhere in there, everyone in Israel should be able to find a connecting point, at least conceptually. If you're of Levi, there is a part of the family tree of Levi that works its way all the way up to the Apostle Matthew. And we know also about Jacob of the house of Levi in Jerusalem because of the Levitical writings. And so there's, there is a continuing story that at least on one of those branches and, and sprouts and leaves takes us all the way to Maurice Glendening. Okay? So here's how Paul identifies himself in Philippians. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, this is bragging, he says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. How good am I? But, Paul is talking to his audience so that they will know where he stands on various things. And it's important sometimes for us to be able to do that. If we're going to declare ourselves to be Levites and Aaronites, then there will be a place where someone will say, Aaronites are supposed to be like this, and I'm not seeing that. What's the deal here? Because... Unfortunately, as everybody in product development and marketing finds out, is the people in your market will become smarter than they were when you started. And the more we teach, which is one of our jobs, 
the more we will expose the possibilities of our not being what we're supposed to be. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of that because the Bible talks about ironing, sharpening, iron sharpening iron. We want that. Because we will not be better than we are if we don't get some input, some motivation from somewhere else. I was talking with my brother-in-law, Gene, about this, and our version of that is, you can't be better than you are if you don't stop being who you are. And somewhere, there will be forces that God brings in to Levi and Aaron that will change us for the better. They will make us do like John said in his five steps. They'll make us recognize and regret and turn. And you'll see all of those things in the book of Malachi. Some of them are realities and some of them are promises that are being fulfilled. But they will change us. And the thing about identity is it produces a... I'll say a perfect goal. Because the more you know about your identity, the more you'll know what you're supposed to be, and the more you'll recognize if you're not there yet. And that's true for every one of us. The basic one is Yeshua. Once you understand what Yeshua did and what he offered to you, then you have an identity choice. Am I going to be in the Messiah or not? Because in the Messiah, I can be all these things that are described in Scripture. Otherwise, not happening. So there's a tremendous motivation in identity. Now, part of the problem with that is desire. And sometimes we need help with desire, and God faithfully promises to help us when we get stuck in the mud. Anybody stuck in the mud, been stuck in the mud, literally, you can raise your hands on that one. How do you get out? Okay, sometimes you need help. Okay. Sometimes it's hard work. If you have the tools and the equipment, you can get yourself unstuck. Okay, if you don't, you need help. Okay. That's why I always like to see these big jacked up pickups with mud all over them, because I wonder if they ever got any help. I don't see them asking for help. But identity is one of those things that it'll produce a goal. And, and so then the question is motivation. Sometimes we need the people around us to say, hey, I can't get there without some help. I'm stuck. And so there are two things to help. What are they? You have to know you need it. You have to ask for it. Okay? Knowing you need it is not a problem. I mean, eventually, you'll find out. Asking for help, that's a little tougher. Our society is not organized towards asking for help. Anyway, that's another whole subject. Okay, so how else would you describe yourself? Kara did it with uh, her school and her age and her parents. Um, what are other ways? Your job. Guys, say amen. Okay. What you do gives you a sense of identity. Why is that? Why does being, I'll say an accountant, I mean, I mean that in a broader term than that, but why does that give you identity? If you tell someone, Dean, that you're an accountant, you're a tax advisor, whatever, who's going to care? Okay. Someone who really has a need. All right. That's why we need to talk to each other, is so that people know what resources we have to offer. 
okay? And it identifies value. Here's a guy who has the value that I need at the moment. Now you will also talk to other people, and I'm sure Dean has, that are in the same profession, who just want to compete with you and see how, who ends up on the top of the ladder. And as we used to say in a lot of our, our discussion sessions, the first liar doesn't have a chance. Okay, Because no matter what you say, somebody else has got a better story or is better at something. So that's why you want to want to be careful about how you paint yourself. Now, in the case of Levi and Aaron, I want to say I'm a Levite. Well, so what difference does that make? Well, because I have an opportunity to help God gather his kingdom and serve his people. What could be better than that? Okay, do I know what that means day to day? Not necessarily. But I take value in the fact that I'm a Levite. Now, within Levi, I take value in the fact that I'm an Aaronite, and I can function as a priest. Okay? Now, we struggle, the women do especially, with, well, what does that mean for my value? Because God said, and he said it, I didn't, that it was the men who were supposed to be the priests as the sons of Aaron. So... If that particular concept is a big problem for you, take it up with him. I don't have the answer. But if you go back to the basic statement that you have value because he created you, we always have to go back to that. Our identity is in our creator. Now, unfortunately, we haven't been given the whole answer book. And I get lots of questions from our own people when I'm talking with people from the outside about, well, how does all this work? And I have to go back to, I don't know. And I encourage you to use that statement as often as it's true. I don't know. But God does, and I want to see it work out. I want to be here for it. I had a friend in, in Idaho and we were talking about Revelation. He said, I want to be one of those that's taken out of this mess when it happens. And I said, why? Wouldn't you rather be equipped to be here for it? To be one of those 144,000 or whoever else is involved in it? Wouldn't you want to be in that situation than to be a spectator and take a lesser place at the table? You know, our identity gives us opportunity. It gives us entrance into things that, that God has promised, that God is doing. We need to take that as our ticket to the game. I have this ticket that says Levi on it. I want to go in Levi's gate, and I want to play on Levi's team. And the fact that I don't know how to do everything right is the coach's problem. It's not mine. And I want Levi on my helmet. I want Levi on my Levi's. In fact, in one of those quotations in Revelation, the very end of the one in Revelation 19, it says, On his robe and his thigh had this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Okay? Now, if that's written on your uniform, you're on his team, how can you lose? So what is it that keeps our identity from giving us enough strength to deal with some of the situations we find ourselves in? When people talk to you about the things of Levi and Aaron or Israel or whatever they are, what is it that causes us the most trouble? I know for me, I'm not sure of a complete answer. But sometimes, like John has alluded to, I try to answer the questions nobody's asking because those are the only answers I have. So sometimes we need to just be quiet and let God give us an answer. There is a promise that the Holy Spirit will give us the words we need to speak in whatever situation we're in. And we need to count on that. You know, 
I don't know if it comes from school or whatever, but it seems like you always got the most credit for being the first to answer, which generates a whole group of people who want to say something before they know anything. So we want to be careful not to do that. Spend a little time in a considered response. And let God put words in your mind that are appropriate for the situation. It's a very practical thing, but if you can be quiet between listening and speaking, then God can do something. And he's promised to do that. See, I think that's one of the hardest things is that that we memorize the promises, kind of like John said with the fruits of the Spirit. But those words don't flash on the screen in front of us when we get in a particular situation. You know, when John is being unloving or unjoyful or what, I'm sure he's not reading, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, etc., etc. And that's why I didn't want to put a lot of words up here for you to stare at. Because I want these concepts to be living. I want them to go in your ears and form a mental image that will come to your mind when you encounter a situation that you don't know how to deal with. And to have that confidence that says, God said I'm a Levite, and this is what Levites do. See, those are two parts of the, of the formula. You have to know who you are and believe that God has given you his value, regardless of what else is going on. And then you have to know enough about what you're supposed to do and the promises that he's made to say, I believe it. Now, some days I may get bruised while I'm doing it. But, and I don't know who the wise man was, he says, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. I really think that's true because, like John gave the example of the biosphere several years ago, those trees started to fall over because they never developed roots. They never had any opposition to deal with, and so they never developed any strength. They could stand up in calm air, and that was it. But the admonition to God's people is to stand. Having done everything you can do, stand. Now, how can you do that? I mean, obviously there's armor and weapons and there are spiritual equivalents to all those analogies. And, but you have to be able to stand up. What allows you to stand? What is the trunk of that tree? It's Yeshua. It's the Father. It's the Creator. They're the ones who told us who we are. And Paul tells us that in Yeshua you are a new creation. You are not like the old man. You do not have to be afraid. This all comes from identity. Okay, so not to drag this out too much longer, but we got, you know, a couple hours left. So here's some of the questions. And we all know about scattering. I mean, does it, is there anybody who needs more information about how God scattered his people? I mean, we had, we had Judah, and because of Solomon, he separated out the ten tribes and created the northern kingdom under Jeroboam, and he established his own form of worship, and God eventually had the Assyrians scatter them out of their land and ultimately across the face of the earth. And Judah, even though they were in Jerusalem, couldn't obey what was given to them, and they were taken off several times. Now, they've been restored. They never lost their name, and that's according to some of the prophecies. Okay. But scattering, that word Jezreel, says there will be a day of scattering in Hosea, which is a day of planting. And we have a lot of good fruit that's coming up. A lot of it's in Christianity. A lot of it's in Hebraic roots. A lot of it in a lot of places we don't even know. There's a lot of it in Africa that we don't have any understanding of what's going on and China. So, so there's a lot of resource out there. There's a lot of harvest to be gathered in. So here's our question. When we have, I'll say this scattered northern kingdom, but really it could be Israel around the earth from wherever they are that doesn't know who they are. 
they're going to be discovering their identity as Israelites because that's one of the things Elijah is called to do. At the end of Malachi, it talks about restoring to the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. That has a lot to do with ancestry and identity. It has to do with saying, I'm a Levite. My ultimate progenitor was Levi himself. And I'm related to Moses and Aaron and Zadok. Those are my people. And somewhere in this history, we got tired of doing our job. And we paid a price. And now I want my job back. And God has promised to do that. Because he said, otherwise, I'm going to smite the earth with a curse if this doesn't happen. So Elijah is out there, and I think he's working independently. He's working with the patriarchs. He's working with whoever God has commissioned to do this. He's working with angels. I don't know how all he's working. But we know that people today are saying, I've got to be an Israelite. It just feels like it. And that's the beginning of a process. So then the question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to welcome them? Now, you know, Maurice Glendening's experience with supposedly the Ephraimites in the LDS church was not real welcoming. Okay? We have struggled with our relationships with those we perceive to be Ephraim. Either they don't understand us, or they don't see a need to relate to us, or whatever. All right? Now, maybe that's part of our problem. You know, maybe we have some issues to deal with. But God will work all that out. Either he'll change us, or he'll change them, or he'll change the situation. Do we believe that's going to work? Do we believe it's going to work for us in our day? That's a harder question than do we believe it's going to work a hundred years down the road. So what do we do today? Will we have something to offer them? Are we going to be willing to share resources? Um, will we want to teach them? And you know, What do you do with people who don't know anything? It's like, oh great, another guy who doesn't know who he is. Okay, well let me tell you who you are. and We'll start at the beginning. And a week later, you got another guy. Okay, we'll start at the beginning. We're going to be starting at the beginning for a long time. Because these are not going to be large masses of groups like assembled at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and they just read the law to everybody at the same time. This is going to happen in a lot of places, which means, by the way, there will be Levites in lots of places. Do you believe that one? Okay. So there's teaching to be done. What about the tangible physical things, meeting needs, housing, other facilities, jobs, things for people to do? Okay. Now that's not solely our responsibility, by the way. But we may end up being the directors. And that's part of what the CASA was supposed to be, was when you had people come to, to a group of Levites, then you gave them help or you told them where they could get help. So we've got to be connected to the rest of the resources in Israel. Now, let me ask you this question. And it may be different for every one of you. But are the people that you have known and that have left your association going to be harder to welcome back than the people you didn't know before? It's like they said, one of the rabbis said about the, about the uh, secular Jews in Israel. It's much easier to talk to a secular Jew about God than it is to talk to an Orthodox Jew. Because the Orthodox guys already have it figured out, and they know you're wrong. So we're going to have to have some input from the Spirit to know how to deal with each individual as they come. And why would they want to associate with us anyway? You know, I mean, they're faced with the same problem, you know. I look at Ron and pick a Ron, by the way. And I say, do I really want to have anything to do with him? 
And he's looking at me saying, do I really want to have anything to do with him? He's weird. Well, we're all weird in our own way. Okay? I'd like to take that term and change it to unique. Because every one of us is unique. We're unique in purpose. It says in Acts that it was God who determined the times and places of our habitations. When he says in Isaiah that I have called you by name, you are mine. He's telling us that every one of us, male, female, Jew, Greek, all of those groups of people, you are still an individual in his sight. Now, there are a lot of spiritual implications about how we're, how we're constructed. There's this idea of we're a spirit clothed with, frat, with flesh. The, the Father took that spirit and he sent us here. And there are a lot of things that we don't completely understand. But we are each individuals. And we need to rely on that because if we start comparing ourselves to each other, in whatever circumstance you find yourself, you'll end up being a loser somewhere. So know that you're a winner. And I love this statement. The fact that you didn't win doesn't make you a loser. Remember that. Because there are no losers in God's economy. There are no losers. Even the heroes in, in Hebrews 11 that have to watch what's going on in these days they didn't get to experience, they're still winners. They built the foundation for what's going on today. And that's because they knew who they belonged to. From Abraham all the way down to Jesus. They did what God called them to do. And since we don't get to judge, we don't have to worry about whether they did the right or wrong thing or who's going to end up in heaven. Okay. Um, so what does your identity give you? Well, there's strength in numbers. Okay, if you hang out with people that you're identified with. There's strength of purpose because you have a common mission. You know, that we have a writing that says if two shall work together... If you work together, you're stronger. And then we have the promises that we talked about. Um, John will get into this. Just think about it. Are we responsible for the actions of a group we're identified with? I would say yes in some degree or another. Uh, and Malachi bears that out in the case of Levi. Um, let me just kind of wrap this up a little bit. What are the benefits and responsibilities of Levites and Aaronites? I mean, why is it a good thing to be a Levite? Well, we're called to service to Israel, to the whole land, to the whole people, and at the place of worship. And we need to be aware of those two things. Uh, there's a scripture in Deuteronomy 18 that says if, if a Levite is moving into your area and comes to the place where God has put his name, you can't forbid him the opportunity to serve there. Now, to me, that says it doesn't matter who wanders in our door. If they are indeed a Levite and an Aaronite, we have to afford them all of the opportunities that that identity gives them. It's required. God says you cannot forbid them to serve. Now that's going to require some wisdom, and I think particularly from the chief high priest. But we have to have this attitude that what God does is good. We need to be more worried about, or more concerned about getting value from what he's doing than we are worried about loss from making a, a poor decision. Because God is the redeemer of all things. If we screw up, he can fix it. Okay, we get to teach Israel the law of their God. And there are new things coming. The writings tell us that there are new laws that will be given. We're just not quite ready for them yet. Um, 
We have places to live among the other tribes, so Levites are going to be scattered. It's something we need to get ready for, is a bigger scale of, Le of Levitical ministry. We receive the tithe. Now, this is kind of a problem because we always seem to be short on money, and we'd really like to have the tithe so we had more money to do what we wanted to do. That really isn't the point. The tithe is a blessing from the obedience of Israel, and they will only know obedience if they are taught the, the instructions of God. So the tithe will follow when the people are prepared. And, and everything else beyond that is just going to be God's provision for where we are now. Okay, we don't have a physical inheritance. We know that. So one of my summary statements is Levites don't get rich. Okay, we are fully consecrated. We've already been taken. Nothing we have is our own. Okay. So if you see a rich Levite, like the one in, is it Judges 28, that was wandering around and the guy wanted him to be his priest? A rich Levite wandering around on his own is not a good thing. Okay, it's our job to bless the people. Now, that in itself is a pretty awesome deal. For the priest to be able to stand up and say, Yahweh bless you and keep you to put his name on the children of Israel. Nobody else is commissioned to do that. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have that same desire wherever you serve. But officially, that's part of our role. And I think we get to do that wherever there are Israelites. That doesn't happen in just one place. And we don't know what our service is going to be for Restored Israel. We've got the foundation for a sanctuary, and it has a role. Um, and in my mind, that's why there are still several things that have to... But from an identity standpoint, that's our piece of concrete out there. That's where we belong. And as quickly as we can complete it, however God brings us through that process, that's where we belong. Because that's the place where we actually can minister effectively to everyone in Israel. And then I'll say finally, it's our job and our privilege to be an example. Because if Israelites can't see what the way of holiness looks like, how are they going to be able to walk it? It's not that we get to just tell them what the rules are and then watch them if they can't obey them. It's that we have to lead them. And that's, that's a valuable part of our identity. So, we need to produce fruit in keeping with our identity. But we need to hold that identity in high regard. It has value because it was given to us by our Creator. It has value and strength as we come together and accept it and desire it. And God has given us promises about what can be fulfilled when we accept and value our inheritance. So let's take a break. Everybody prop their eyelids up because some of them are falling. What? Not take a break? Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you want to come up and look at this, it's just paper on foam board, so, you know, don't tackle it. But. Yeah, I had some other things to share, but I'm aware of the wisdom of Mark Twain about the ability to seek to endure a few other things. We were going to try to get back together at 3, but I think that's what it is, 5, 2, 30. Okay. I'll just take a few moments to go through uh, what we have here on Malachi. So why don't we all stand?